We will begin the meeting of the Medical Board of California in just one moment. Uh, before I uh, call the meeting to order and convene uh, the meeting, I want to take this opportunity to welcome a very special guest to the Medical Board. Uh, State Senator Hill is with us today. He serves as a, an important committee chair that has jurisdiction over this board and other boards within the Department of Consumer Affairs. He's been very generous with his time in meeting with us uh, when we had our ledge day in the early part of uh, this year. And he's asked to um, speak before the board and we're so very fortunate to have him this afternoon. Senator. Thank you very much, Doctor. I really appreciate this opportunity, and I, I just want to thank you for the great work you do. Um, people don't appreciate how hard and how difficult it is, especially these meetings <laughs> coming up, and I know with the work that you do and in practice and everything is, is, makes it challenging, but we do appreciate it very much. Um, it is a sacrifice. I know it's an honor. I feel the honor that I have in my position, but it is. It's a, it's a sacrifice at times, and, uh, but thank you uh, for the, uh, the welcome. Um, and I've met a number of you over the years and uh, appreciate that. And, and I just wanted to, to say that Kimberly and uh, Jennifer are two people that I deal with on a more daily basis or weekly basis, however it is, but uh, how extraordinary they are in the, the work that they have uh, uh, in representing you and, uh, and bringing things uh, forward. I, I wanted to just share, if I could, a couple of, of things that, uh, and, and also that I wanted to just comment of how the improvements in the board over the last few years and uh, what I know before I was involved in it, but the challenges that the board faced and how the leadership has made and the administration of it has made such major changes. And I know the Sunset Review will be coming up in 2017 and I'm sure things will, will go smoothly with that. Um, I'm honored to chair the Business and Professions Committee in the Senate. The, um, uh, some people wonder, you know, why, why would you want that position or what's, what gets you motivated, what, what gets you engaged in things. And, and I have to say that, that I've been looking at um, a number of things that kind of motivate me in, in political life. Uh, and I don't want to say I get upset about things, but I get kind of passionate about it when I see things that I don't understand or I think could be should and should be changed. To give you a couple of examples. Um, when I first became an assembly member in 2008, I was sitting at home in San Mateo, by the way, welcome to the 13th Senate District. Um, and I was sitting there reading the paper and I saw of an individual who was got out of his car in front of a Starbucks, which is down in San Mateo, and staggered into the Starbucks. Two highway patrolmen were in there having coffee um, and um, they arrested him. It was his ninth DUI and he had a valid California driver's license. I just, the first thing that comes to mind is what state would do that? There's something wrong. So I got very engaged, upset about it, tried to change it, still working on making those changes. We were able to make some, but as you know, the reality in Sacramento and the politics sometimes makes change a little difficult. But we fought it and I did it. And then a couple of years after that, about two miles from where we're sitting, up on that hill in San Bruno, eight of my constituents and 38 homes were, eight lost their lives, and 38 homes were destroyed in a natural gas pipeline explosion. If you look at that as an accident, then accidents happen. But then as you unpeel, peel down that onion and see what actually caused that, it wasn't an accident. And then when we saw the, the path that led to that, the regulatory environment, the what I would say actually was the corruption within the utility, I got angry, I got upset, and felt I had to change that and do something about that. that that's what sometimes motivates me. And so one thing that I wanted to share with you that, that I, I kind of look at myself as kind of an average guy. You know, someone reads the paper in the morning and sees something, gets kind of passionate about it. And one of the things that, that I know you look at and grapple with, and I know it's, it's, been, it's difficult because of the kind of the vertical enforcement model that you uh, that 
took some of the power from you, but this board does make those final decisions on discipline. Um, one of the issues that kind of struck me and kind of, kind of got me a little going was when I read in the paper about the case of a physician in Orange County who killed a few people, also had kind of counterfeit forged material in his body in, that he was placing in someone's body. And that physician gets five years probation. I looked at that and I kind of got initially upset with that, thinking that there's something wrong, similar to how I've been in the past. So I guess, in, and then I looked at some of the other cases and felt similarly concerned. So I guess my point is that I, I, I hope you, and I know you, are as concerned as I am about protecting the public and the patients that you, that everyone, the medical profession sees and serves throughout this state. And as someone who looks at the Department of Consumer Affairs and really our responsibility is, is to make sure that they have, uh, that they are protected. And so I know that you're as concerned as I am and I, and I hope you look at that and continue to in the future because it's something that is, uh, 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 that I think in representing the people as you do, I, I think they, they would feel the same if they heard that. And so I just wanted to share those thoughts with you today and, and again to thank you for, for your diligent hard work. And, what you do. and I'd be, if, 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 if someone have questions, I'd be happy to, to answer any questions if someone had some, it'd be my pleasure. The colleagues, do you have any general comments or questions? Howard? I'd like to reiterate our thanks for your coming down. Uh, and I appreciate that you are in weekly contact with Kim and Jennifer. Because in peeling the onion, it does start with reading the newspaper. But I know you also appreciate how difficult a job this is. Yes. Uh, and all of the decisions we make are made in collaboration with the Attorney General's office. And very often in our meetings, we're the ones who are pushing for more. But with respect to due process in the law, sometimes we have to peel the onion in the physician's licensure and discipline as well. Uh, so we are as concerned as you are to protect the people of California. And I want you to know that that's the viewpoint that we're coming from. We're not here to protect physicians. We're here to protect the people. Thank you. And thank you, Doctor. And, and, I, and I, I agree with you. I, in looking at the challenges that you're faced with in those disciplinary procedures, uh, and I think that's what we need to look at legislatively or just make sure that due process is served, but at the same time, the public is served as well, and that's a goal. And I'll be happy to work with Kimberly and, and more on that because I think it's important. So. And very good. Thank you. Thank you very I much, Doctor. I can tell you how valuable it is to hear directly from a legislator on what they're thinking, because <laughs> it helps us. Oh, so thank good. you very and much. And thank you to your staff as well. Oh, thank you very much. And they're excellent. I mean, Sarah's outstanding. But thank you again. And uh, I appreciate the opportunity. And we will be uh, working closely together and uh, uh, wishing you all great success. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. I want to ask all of us to please turn our cell phones to silent and make sure they are off. Uh, sure, they are off the table so we can avoid unnecessary feedback. You may notice uh, committee members accessing their laptops during the meeting. They are using the laptops to access board materials. We have designated time on the agenda for public comment and ask for public comment on each agenda item. I ask that you be respectful of the need to conduct the board's business. Should anyone disrupt the meeting, I will ask the person to conduct himself or herself in such a manner that allows the board to conduct its affairs. This meeting will be available via teleconference. Individuals listening to the meeting will have an opportunity to provide public comment and will be assisted by a moderator who will be facilitating the teleconferencing process. For those members uh, of the public participating via teleconference, please wait until the moderator has introduced you before you make comments. To request to make a comment during the public comment period, press star 1 
you will hear a tone indicating that you are in the queue for comment. If you change your mind and do not wish to make a comment, press the pound sign. Assistance is available throughout the teleconference meeting. To request a specialist, press star zero. Each person will be limited to three minutes per agenda item. However, during agenda item two, public comments on items not on the agenda, the board has limited public comment period for individuals on the teleconference to 20 minutes. In addition, public comment from individuals here at the meeting will also be limited to 20 minutes. Thus, after 20 minutes, no further comments will be accepted. During public comment on any other agenda item, 10 minutes will be allowed for comments from individuals on the teleconference line and those in the audience. After 10 minutes, no further comments will be accepted. Business services staff will be assisting me uh, on receiving the public comments via teleconference during this meeting. The board welcomes public comment on any, agenda, any item on the agenda and it is the board's intent to ask for public comment prior to the board taking action on an agenda item. If for some reason I forget to ask, the pu ask for public comment on an agenda item and you wish to speak on that item, please raise your hand and you will be recognized. I would like to remind all speakers to complete a presenter's slip so I can call your name at the appropriate time and that there is a record of this meeting that can be full and complete. Please give the speaker slips to Ms. Lisa Toof, to my left. Hello. Hi. Hi, Lisa. I will do my best to call upon everyone who has supplied a slip for the agenda item and recognize those who wish to make a last minute comment. But we ask that you fill out a speaker slip after the comments so we have a complete record. I want to remind all speakers to try to stay on topic and keep your comments under three minutes. We hope to end today's meeting at 5.45 p.m. I would like to call this meeting to order and ask Ms. Toof to please call the roll. Dr. Bolat? Dr. Bishop? Here. Dr. Ganadev? Here. Dr. Hawkins? Here. Dr. Kraus? Present. Dr. Levine? Here. Dr. Lewis? Ms. Pines? Here. Ms. Shipsky? Ms. Wright? Here. Ms. Yaroslavsky? Present. Dr. Yip? Here. And Mr. Serrano Sewell? Uh, present. We have a quorum. Thank you. Uh, moving on to agenda, before I move on to agenda item two, I wanted to recognize somebody from the Department of Consumer Affairs uh, Division of Legislative and Regulatory Review, Adam J. Quinones. I saw him. Hello, Adam. Thank you for being here today. Appreciate it. Um, moving on now to agenda item two, public comments on items not on the agenda. I have some speakers. Slips. Lisa. Hi. McEffert. Miriam. And Michelle. Hello. Hi, good afternoon. Um, I'm here uh, on behalf of the Safe Patient Project of Consumers Union. We're the advocacy arm of Consumer Reports. And I'm here today to present to you with signatures of more than 5,100 Californians who urge you to require physicians who are on probation to disclose their probationary status to their patients. The signatures were recently gathered online beginning in June by Consumers Union, and I will leave this with you and give it to Lisa when I finish. Um, I'd like to make a few points. There are about 400 uh, physicians on probation in California now, including for violations that are very serious related to substance abuse, sexual misconduct, violence, and repeated negligent acts. Most of these physicians are actively practicing. The requirement we're asking you to add to probationary orders would directly affect a tiny fraction of California physicians, 400 among the 102,000 California physicians in active practice today, most of them who are 
following all the rules and meeting all the standards, just 400 that we're asking you to act on, it seems like a small number, but it's a paramount issue for the patients that they are treating. We think it's unreasonable for us to completely rely on postings on the medical board website as a primary way to inform patients of physicians who have been disciplined. Most patients don't even know about the medical board. They certainly don't know where to look for information and how to look it up their doctor. It's unlikely that patients would go to look up a doctor that they've been seeing for a while who may have recently been disciplined. And there are many patients who don't have access to internet. A uh, recent Pew uh, Trust report came out last week uh, and it f identified the groups of people who are high on the list of not having internet access, elders, uh, low income, rural, and black and Hispanic uh, consumers. In some cases, keeping this information from patients leaves vulnerable people to, uh, p leaves them to vulnerable to dangerous care or without knowledge of maybe probation limitations. And we believe that's unethical. The current guidelines of the board require doctors to notify their, the hospitals where they practice as well as the medical malpractice insurers, but they are not required to tell the very people who uh, who are affected the most, and that's the patients. The patients, and we have found several cases uh, to lead us to believe that occasionally the board does require physicians to notify their patients under certain circumstances. We're recommending that the board amend the guidelines uh, to make this a standard condition that doctors notify their patients about their probation status. And, um, and we really urge you that if you believe that all California consumers should know the history of the disciplinary actions of any healthcare provider they may consider seeing, that you should be willing to take this kind of action. Please conclude we, your we comments. We look forward to discussing this uh, with you further in October. Thank you. Thank you. Marion Hollingsworth. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Marion Hollingsworth, and I'm a patient safety advocate in the La Mesa area. You have just heard Lisa McGivert speak about the importance of doctor disclosure for probation. We feel this is a very integral part of the informed consent process. We hope you take it seriously when the issue of doctors on probation is discussed at the upcoming medical board meeting in October in San Diego. As you may have heard, Mr. Serrano Sewell has given us his word that this issue will be on the agenda at that time. I also want you to know that the media is following the story and feels it's important from the consumer safety standpoint. The ABC affiliate in San Diego, 10 News, did a report on the Consumers Union Docs on Probation petition in June. And just a couple of weeks ago, the Sacramento Bee newspaper ran an op-ed I wrote about the importance of doctor disclosure for probation. I have provided each of you with a copy of this op-ed that I believe has been distributed by the wonderful Lisa and take time to read it carefully to see the importance of doctor disclosure from a patient safety standpoint. Thank you so much for your time. I look forward to the testimony when the board takes up the matter of doctors on probation in October. Thank you. Thank you. Michelle Montserrat Ramos. Hello. Good afternoon. My name is Michelle Montserrat Ramos, and um, Consumers Union provides its advocates with an opportunity to write guest blogs for their Safe Patient Project website. I contributed a post recently discussing a doctor on probation, a comparison between the DMV and the MBC, asking readers who did a better job of protecting the public. The example of licensee was a doctor with a long arrest, um, arrest record, including spending eight months in jail. The DMV took swift action before the NBC did. The licensee actually surrendered his license, reapplied, and got his license back only for the rehabilitated physician to violate probation six to seven months later. I brought copies 
of my blog for each of you to review, and it should address many questions as we continue to discuss this important patient safety issue. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Are there additional comments from members of the audience on agenda item two? Seeing none, are there any comments from the phone on agenda item two? We have no comments from the phone lines. Thank you. If, let's move on to our next agenda item three, approval of the minutes of the May 7, May 8, 2015 board meeting. So moved. It's been uh, moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Seeing no discussion, any comments uh, from the audience on agenda item three? None. Any comments from the phone? No, sir. All right, thank you. Ms. Toof, can you please call the roll? Dr. Bolot, present. Yes. Aye. Aye. Sorry. <laughs> Dr. Bishop? Aye. Dr. Ganadev? Aye. Dr. Hawkins? Dr. Krause? Yes. Dr. Levine? Aye. Dr. Lewis? Aye. Ms. Pines? Aye. Ms. Shipsky? Ms. Wright? Aye. Ms. Yaroslavsky? Aye. Dr. Yip? Aye. Mr. Serrano Sewell? Aye. Motion carries. Uh, on to the next agenda item, item four board member communications with interested parties. Ms. Yaroslavsky? I, I had an hour-long conversation with several members of the Safe Patient Project, Consumers Union, and they made um, the same points that you've heard earlier today. And I heard what they said. They were very passionate and very concerned. And I told them that I hoped that we would find a way to work more closely on and more collaboratively on trying to figure out a way to inform the public better on how to get to our website so they should be checking their doctors online. But I wanted to thank them for the opportunity to speak with them. Uh, thank you. David. Yes, Dr. Bishop. Uh, yes, I uh, had a nice conversation with the uh, past president of the California Association of Physicians Assistants regarding uh, State Bill, uh, Senate Bill 337. Ms. Wright. Green, oh, green light. that's very simple. Um, I had an hour-long conversation with the Consumers Union Safe Pageant Project folks as well, and I appreciate their, you know, passion for what they're expressing to us, and hope there's a way to um, figure out how to take some of their passion and meld it with consumer protection. I too had a uh, good con con phone call conversation with the Consumer uh, Union on on the topic. Um, that was just discussed on the previous agenda item, as well as having a meeting with the director of the Department of Consumer Affairs, which I'll discuss in detail in my report. If there's no other um, disclosures, uh, we can then move to agenda item five, presentation on physician health programs. Oh, co comment? I apologize. Thank you. Uh, as to agenda item four, for board member communications. Are there any comments from the audience? Public comments. Seeing none, are there any comments from the phone on agenda item four? Ernie, are there any comments from the phone? We do have someone queuing up now. Be just a moment, please. Thank you. comes from the line of Carolyn Navarro, a mother of a patient. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Yes, I have another comment. Um, when you investigate a complaint, I would like to suggest that you talk to the consumer before you make decisions because I had a doctor actually quote me as saying, I agreed to have my daughter discharged from the hospital. Ms. Navarro? Yes. This is public comment on agenda item four. I was trying to comment earlier, but it moved. I didn't get a chance. I actually did hit the option several times, so I'm sorry about that. But I wish you would do that with actually talk to the consumer before you make a decision. Because I was trying to comment on the prior comments just a few moments ago on the agenda, and I had trouble. I'm sorry. 
That's fine. If you can proceed, ma'am, with your comments. my daughter when I did not agree. I told four people at the hospital I was not told my appeals rights. This doctor discharged my daughter and my daughter went home to her group home. She's autistic. She bled on the brain for 10 days altogether and then they finally diagnosed her with an AVM on her brain and she ended up in the ICU for, for a week and then she's forced to go to this HMO hospital where they deny she had a blood clot on her brain after she was diagnosed at an independent hospital. So I wish you would talk to the, fam the family member before you make a decision and close a complaint like you did to me, which I'm appealing, but you closed it without even talking to me. And that's why I'm so upset, because if the answers that the doctors give to this are not correct. So that's what I wanted to say about this. All right, thank you for your comments. Okay, I appreciate your time. I'm sorry I got upset earlier, but I'm very upset about what happened to my daughter. Thank you for your comments, ma'am. We'll now move to agenda item five, presentations on physician health programs, um, discussion and uh, consideration. Ms. Robertson? Thank you. Good afternoon, President and members. Please turn to page BRD 5-1 through 5-22 for the staff report on physician health programs. To give you some background, the Medical Board has not had a formal physician health program since the diversion program was sunsetted in 2008. The Board operated the diversion program from 1980 until it was eliminated in 2008. The diversion program was meant to provide public protection by including monitoring controls on impaired physicians to prevent them from working while under the influence. The program required participants to sign a five-year contract adhering to certain conditions, including but not limited to evaluation by a committee, random biological fluid testing, inpatient treatment, psychiatric care, group therapy sessions, um, alcohol anonymous meetings, and work site monitors. In order to successfully complete this program, participants were required to have at least three years sobriety. At the request of the board, I gathered some information on the physician health programs in other states. I also looked at some of the California Healing Arts Health programs. In California, any program contracted to provide monitoring services to impaired licensees must comply with the uniform standards set forth in Senate Bill 1441, Ridley Thomas, that was passed in 2008. Most California Healing Art Boards offer some form of assistance for impaired licensees. For example, the California Board of Pharmacy and the Physical Therapy Board of California operate health programs through a contract with the company Maximus. Um, Appendix 1 on pages BRD 5-3 and 5-4, I tried to show you some of the laws pertaining to the pharmacist recovery program that is offered to licensees, licensed pharmacists or interns whose competency may be impaired due to abuse of alcohol, drug use, and mental illness. In Appendix 2, pages BRD 5-5 through 5-7 contain some of the laws on the Physical Therapy Substance Abuse Rehabilitation Program. This program is offered to physical therapists or physical therapist assistants whose competency is impaired due to abuse of drugs or alcohol only. Both programs offer both board referred or self referrals and the contractor is required to notify the board if a participant is unsuccessful in the program. To give you some examples of some of the other state physician health programs, in Appendix 3 I've uh, placed the Alabama Physician Health Program Laws that are found on pages BRD 5-8 and 5-9. These laws outline the funding and the authority to contract services for a physician wellness committee. It also contains reporting and disclosure requirements of the committee. 
and requires an annual report concerning the operations and proceedings of the committee. In Appendix 4, the Arizona Physician Health Program laws are on pages BRD 5-10 and 5-11. And Dr. Sutcher is here today to present information on the Arizona Monitored Aftercare Program. Uh, Dr. Gunderson will be here tomorrow to provide information on the Colorado's Physician Health Program. The Colorado laws are found in Appendix 5 and are on pages BRD 5-12 and 5-13. Lastly, Appendix 6 contains information compiled from the Federation of State Physician Health Programs. This chart shows information for each state and can be found on pages BRD 5-14 to 5-22. As noted in the chart, California, Nebraska, and Wisconsin does not have a formal physician health program. In reviewing other state health programs, it appears that no one program is alike. With that said, every program administrator or director I either spoke with on the phone or communicated with by email was very passionate about their program and seemed dedicated to the success of the program. Um, let's see. Most of the programs that communicated with me stated that they, they offer self-referral self-referral as well as board referrals. Um, Kentucky was kind of unique in that they didn't have a confidential referral. In fact, um, he stated that they were completely transparent and that they have a policy that states that all licensed physicians must report concerns of impaired, of impaired physicians to the board. With regards to some of the types of entities that operate these programs, it was reported that 42% of the programs are operated by in independent entities. Most of those entities are nonprofit. 42% were operated by the Medical Association, and 16% were operated by the medical boards. In Idaho, uh, they were jointly operated by the Medical Board and the Medical Association. And in Virginia, they actually contract with the Virginia Commonwealth University Department of Psychiatry to run their program. The data reported also shows that about 62% of the operating entities have a contractual relationship with the medical board. The chart in Appendix 6 indicates which programs have a contractual relationship. It may indicate if that relationship is by law a memorandum of understanding, or some other type of arrangement. It also shows that 11 programs don't have a formal contract with the medical board. Uh, seven of those are operated by the medical association, and four of those are operated by independent entities. With regard to the types of impairments that are serviced by these programs, all state programs reported that they offer referrals for substance use disorders. Most of them reported that they offer services for mental and behavioral health. And about half of those reporting offer referral for sexual misconduct and physical illness. The state programs are funded from a variety of sources and many programs have multiple funding sources. For example, Connecticut reports funding from malpractice insurance companies, hospitals in private contributions, and participant fees. In review of the funding sources for all state health programs, the data shows that about 71% receive funding from medical boards. About 56% receive funding from participant fees. 51% receive funding from hospitals, private organizations, and or grants. 40% receive funding from medical societies, and 38% receive funding from malpractice insurance companies. That concludes my report on physician health programs. Are there any questions? Members, do you have any comments or questions at this stage? We'll have a presentation and then questions and comments as well, but Dr. Krause? Uh, I appreciate that the uh, staff is looking into this, and I appreciate that we have programs today and tomorrow. 
Uh, I think we all recognize that it's not just a physician health and well-being issue, but it's an issue of protecting the public. Because in California is no longer having a physician's health program, uh, I believe that physicians are hiding their illness, uh, hiding drug dependency, hiding alcoholism, hiding mental illness, uh, and that California consumers are at greater risk than they may be if we can put together a physician health program that works. And I think we should commit ourselves at each meeting to have physician's health program on our agenda until we've got a new physician's health program in California. So thank you for your research. That's very helpful. As Ms. Robinson mentioned, um, the medical director from the state of Colorado was un unable to get here today as planned. So we'll continue, we'll have a discussion and a presentation from Arizona's program and then continue this item till tomorrow and then we can take any action that the board may desire. But right now, if Dr. Suture, if you could come and begin your presentation. His CV and experience is in the board packet, but just know that he is a nationally recognized expert and speaker on this subject matter, and we're quite fortunate to have him and his colleague today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here, and uh, we're really excited that you have interest in this area now. Uh, with me is Dr. David Greenberg. Uh, we've been in practice together as partners and have been the operators of the Arizona Physician Medical Board's Physician Health Program since 1992. So uh, we're really pleased to show you what we do in Arizona and hope that'll be useful uh, to you. Thank you, Dr. Greenberg, for being here. Uh, this is just a brief list of kind of the topics we hope to cover in the brief time we have, and we're happy to take any questions at, at any point in time. Um, this is quoted out of the statute and represents our mission, and I think it's important just to take a look at that very first line, that our primary mission is to ensure protection of public health and safety through this program with education, intervention, assessment, post-treatment monitoring, uh, relapse prevention, and, and everything that you see here. And when we started in 1992, we really simply uh, dealt with substance use disorders and occasionally co-occurring mental health issues. But presently, the Physician Health Program deals with all the issues that you heard mentioned, uh, not only including mental health and behavioral issues, but also uh, boundary crossing, aging, uh, chronic pain, uh, virtually every thing that can afflict a physician, which is what can afflict anyone. Um, just to give you a little brief history, uh, our program initiated in 1986. It was sponsored by the Arizona Medical Association. It provided these services for every health care board in Arizona except pharmacy and nursing, which had their own programs. It was operated through the Arizona Medical Association until 1992 at which point the Medical Society and the Medical Board parted company. Uh, they put that program out to bid. Uh, Dr. Greenberg, who had worked for the board as a lead investigator, uh, came back, bid on that program, drafted me to help him as I had helped the Medical Society toward the end of their term. And we have been the contractor ever since, and we have to competitively bid for this contract every so many years. Um, and so, the other interesting point that is up until 2009, we were primarily substance use disorders, but we added the other physician health program functions at that time. And one of the other key things that makes us a little different is uh, that we have an extremely close relationship with the medical board. Um, we work closely with the executive staff, so you see the executive director. The, the physician health program manager, Ms. Muller, has been with the board almost 20 years. So. We have a long, and, and probably between the three of us, nobody has been there longer. Uh, board members, board staff, uh, we've been around a very long time. And we have an extensive staff, and we have consultants in virtually every discipline and specialty, as well as psychotherapists and psychologists. Virtually whatever we need throughout the state, we have available to us, depending on the specific case. And we also want you to know that we don't operate in isolation. We're audited regularly by the State Auditor General. 
Uh, and that to, I will tell you that we have passed every audit with uh, flying colors. The only criticism we got is that we weren't persistent enough at making participants pay on a timely basis. Uh, and we recognize we have many physicians, uh, resident physicians, physicians assistants who need help and who've done some difficulties uh, in their career and their life. Um, again, we've been very close historically. Uh, I probably have daily, if not weekly, uh, contact with uh, leadership of the board and the PHP managers at the board. We meet with investigative staff, assistant attorney generals. We help virtually with the entire process. We attend every board meeting. We don't have many cases that go to the board anymore because most of them are handled internally between us and board staff. But we're there whenever there's a case, and we're there when there's not a case, because often these issues come up, and we're there as, as a resource to them. And, uh, and that's helped build that relationship. We know every board member on a na first name basis. And again, uh, and feel free to jump in, our primary mission is public safety. Advocating for physicians is secondary, but it's also public safety, because you need a safe physician who would be a healthy physician. Um, and just to, I'll try and go briefly through the process of how we do this. Uh, we get self-referrals, but we also get referrals from all of the things you see there, hospitals, medical staffs, colleagues, patients, nurses, family members. And, and Arizona is a mandatory reporting state. That means that any physician who is aware of another physician who is or may be unsafe to practice must report. That same obligation uh, goes to hospitals and ambulatory surgery centers as well. Uh, and then, of course, uh, law enforcement is our friend. Uh, they help identify people. Uh, I used to, you know, the, one of the prior directors of the medical board said to me one time, you know, every time a physician gets arrested, uh, it gets reported to us. And I thought that was interesting. And then I started thinking, wait a minute, my driver's license doesn't say I'm a physician. My car registration, I said, how do they know? He said, well, usually the first word out of their mouth is, I'm a doctor. You can't do this to me. <laughs> I used to lecture and say, don't tell them you're a doctor. But now we have a law that says if you're arrested for any reason, you must report for all health care uh, licensed practitioners, not just physicians. So when we are referred somebody by the medical board, and all of our referrals come through the medical board, there is no individual who is a licensed allopathic physician or PA who comes to us who isn't sent through the medical board. And if someone calls me and I say, you must report yourself to the medical board who will then turn around and send you to me. There are some urgent situations where we work together to get the person into treatment as quickly as possible. But we don't have any participants who are licensed by the board who the board is not aware of. Uh, so we do a, an initial health assessment, which is generally with Dr. Greenberg or I, but occasionally with a psychiatrist who works with us or some other discipline, depending on the issue. And typically, we come up with one of four or five recommendations. Uh, first might be that there really isn't anything here and that we, don't, we believe the individual is safe to practice. We don't think further action on the board's behalf is necessary. They get to make the final decision. We have two different monitoring tracks for substance use disorders, which I'll go into a little more. So they might be referred to either one of those. Uh, if you go into the moderate to severe dependence track, in other words, you're a drug addict or an alcoholic, you've got to go to treatment first, 30 to 90 days of residential treatment at a board approved center, and then you come back and enter our program. Um, sometimes we send people for comprehensive evaluations. You guys have probably heard of these two to seven day evaluations, places like the Betty Ford Center, uh, Promises, and others uh, that do this. And, um, and then there are individuals with other medical or psychiatric issues who are assessed and then either are referred to appropriate treatment or continue treatment, which we then monitor uh, based on the individual condition. Once we cre uh, finish our assessment, and by the way, when we do this initial assessment, the first question is, are they safe to practice or not? And it's yes, no, or unable to determine. Uh, so it's, I mean, we give very clear statements. Uh, and then the board makes a final recommendation. And, and when I say board, in this instance, I'm mostly referring to board staff. 
Um, and the other thing that are reviewed is whether there's any patient care issues, significant statute violations, which is the board's job to impose discipline. That's not our job. Our job is to determine someone's health status and fitness for duty. Just to brief you, briefly give you an overview of what a comprehensive evaluation is, and uh, we refer about 10% of our assessments for this more comprehensive process. 90% of the time, uh, we're able to determine what the issue is or isn't. So that would include a medical addiction, psychiatric evaluation, psychological evaluation and testing, drug testing, collateral information. By the way, everybody we assess gets a hair drug test and a comprehensive urine drug test. Mandatory. It doesn't matter what the nature of the referral is. And believe me, we found some really interesting surprises over the years uh, that we didn't expect. We sometimes do medical polygraphs. We sometimes do neuropsychiatric evals, again, depending on the circumstances. And then the outcome of that evaluation has to tell us those specific things. What's the diagnosis or diagnoses? What sort of treatment is recommended, if any? And are they fit for duty, or what will it take to get them to be fit for duty? Um, and typically, uh, they may come out on the substance abuse side, mild under the DSM-5, which we used to call substance abuse, or moderate to severe, which we used to call dependence. And then there are other diagnoses based on the conditions. But we spend a lot of our time uh, and a lot of our energy on protecting the public and fitness for duty. Uh, you can end up in the abuse track if you don't reach the more severe diagnoses. Typically, that's diagnostic monitoring while providing public safety protection. Uh, in other words, if somebody has enough of a problem to get into that track, we don't know if they've gone, gotten, go, gotten to the state of dependence or not, or addiction, but we're going to monitor them, require them to be abstinent, and that protects the public while we're doing that. And then if you, again, are in the dependence track, you can end up there on a confidential, non-disciplinary, stipulated rehabilitation agreement, or there may be a public probationary agreement. Typically, the medical terms are similar. Um, so tip, did I skip one? No. Uh, for the dependence track, typically you have a diagnosis of uh, moderate to severe substance use disorders. We have found that if you get less than 28 to 30 days of treatment, you're about 95% likely to relapse in 18 months or less. If you get 30 or more days of residential treatment followed by five years of accountable, structured monitoring, your likelihood of being sober is somewhere in the 90, 85 to 95 percent range, consistent with nationally peer-reviewed data. You'll hear some of that from Dr. Gunderson tomorrow as well. Uh, and uh, typically, uh, this is done through a signed stipulated rehabilitation agreement, which, with his, which is with the medical board, which we then oversee and monitor. And we report to the board any relapse, any uns lack of safety to practice, any serious non-correctable non-compliance. And uh, again, you can get in there via criminal statute violations. We've had some very flamboyant arrests over the years. Uh, we had one uh, family doctor who was running a meth lab in his house uh, while his wife ran a daycare center in the front of the house. Um, needless to say, that was problematic. Uh, but you get into the disciplinary track if there are issues around patient safety or direct patient harm, or if you've uh, committed significant statute violations or crimes. Or uh, you only are eligible for the confidential side of this if it's the first time and there's no patient care or significant criminal activities. So if you're in that track and you relapse, now you become disciplinary. If you had graduated the program and you relapse, now you become disciplinary. Um, so, and those people need to stop work, additional treatment, and they come back on probation and maybe other discipline, depending on what the circumstances are. This is something that we've been doing for a number of years now. If you were impaired in the workplace, if that's how you got to our attention, and I saw a physician two days ago who had showed up for reported to work in his clinic drunk, noticed initially by a patient, subsequently by staff. 
he will not be eligible for confidentiality, and he is pulled out of practice immediately. And, of course, he's going directly to rehab, too. Um, but whether he went to rehab or not, he's pulled out of practice, and uh, he's not eligible for confidentiality. And that's something that we started a, a few years back. These are kind of the terms. They very much match up with 1441. Uh, the work we do in California, because we also run a comparable monitoring program throughout the state, which we've been doing since 2008 on a private basis, matches 1441. But uh, obviously you have to abstain from alcohol and mood-altering drugs. There's random alcohol and drug testing, which is not only random, but can also be directed. If we're worried, we reserve the right to test people by any means at any time. And drug testing is a whole science of itself, and we don't have the time to discuss it, but, it, but suffice it to say, we are in a very low-tech specialty, but we do have pretty slick drug testing, which is getting slicker. Uh, weekly relapse prevention therapy groups, face-to-face -face contact with peers and an experienced therapist, mandatory, very helpful at identifying behavior before it devolves into relapse. Case management, documented self-help meeting attendance, you have to have a board-approved primary care physician. Can't be yourself anymore. No more being your own doctor. And we also say they can't be in trouble with the board, and they can't be in one of our programs at the same time. And uh, we have to, therefore, vet and approve that individual, sometimes with the board. Only prescribed medications, uh, no foods with alcohol and poppy seeds. We had one doctor. He said, well, I didn't really take morphine. I was on my way to the lab, and I drove by an Einstein's bagels, and they smelled so good, I ate 12 poppy seed bagels on my way to the lab. I'm like, no, nah, we're not going to buy that. Um, you know, I, I, I tell people frequently, I was born at night, just wasn't last night, you know. Um, <laughs> uh, we do use worksite monitors. We do use psychiatric or psychological care when needed. And then things around reporting relapse, letting us know when they're out of town. Uh, and paying fees and the five-year term. Uh, you are non-compliant if you don't do any of those things, but the most significant thing, positive drug tests, missed drug tests, uh, not testable test uh, drug tests, you know, low specific gravity, adulterated. Uh, our labs are pretty good, and uh, we use First Lab here in California, which is the DCA lab, uh, and they're pretty good at picking up synthetic urine, but they're getting better all the time, too. It's, it's, it's a real effort. Uh, they are only allowed excused group misses up to a certain number, and work is not an excuse, by the way. Uh, they have to arrange their schedule to be present at their weekly group. Uh, they can't miss going to 12 help meeting, self-help meetings, and they uh, have to have a primary care doc. And again, they can't be their own doctor anymore. You can only take aspirin, Tylenol, or ibuprofen without it being in your primary care doctor's records. And, and I will tell you, we require them to keep a log of medication, and we match that up when there's something that shows up in a drug screen. And uh, we had one physician who showed up with tramadol and yet had not listed it. And we called his, we, we got a hold of his family doctor's records. You guys are very helpful as the Arizona Medical Board is at subpoenaing medical records. And there was a note from the primary care physician saying, Dr. Jones called the day after I called him. Please put in the record that you told me I could take tramadol three weeks ago. Uh, uh, he was subsequently revoked, unfortunately. Um, and failure to pay fees, that's where we got dinged, right? Um, but... We work hard at that. And then uh, if they don't provide reports or obviously relapse. But if they do everything they're supposed to do, the agreement terminates five years later. And some individuals run interim agreements for a period of months uh, while the case is being investigated by the board. Uh, but that counts toward their five years. And then uh, if they're not doing what they're supposed to do for us, and you guys tell me how I'm doing on time here. Um, if it's not a relapse, uh, we meet with them. Uh, we may, if we can't correct the behavior, uh, refer them for discipline. Uh, and uh, if they relapse or if we think they're unsafe to practice, uh, they have to sign a, a practice limitation and then get whatever additional treatment is necessary. Uh, practice, restriction. practice restriction, thanks. Which is a disciplinary action. 
it would be it would be a, a practice restriction, which is a formal disciplinary action and goes on the database. One last thing about uh, that would be uh, that if, if a participant has a second relapse, uh, according to our statutes, they revoke for five years and they can reapply for a license after five. I think another five or so minutes. Okay, we can allow I'll, enough time I'll, I'll for, hustle for questions. This. I think. Thank you. Thank you. No, no, thanks. Uh, and, and along those lines, when we say someone is confidential, it's limited confidentiality. It means it's not on the board's website, it's not reported to the National Practitioner Data Bank or the Federation of State Medical Boards, but they have to give a copy of that agreement to any employer, any hospital they're on the staff of or become on the staff of, or any surgery center. They also have to answer affirmatively any questions on malpractice renewals, reappointment applications, uh, and so on. So uh, the, the confidentiality is limited. As, as Dr. Greenberg was just saying, we have a three-strike policy. So the first time, if, everything, if there's no patient care or criminal issues, confidential, no discipline. Second time, it's uh, agreement not to practice additional treatment, usually 90 days, and probation or discipline. And the third strike would be voluntary surrender or revocation, and you would be ineligible to reapply for five years, at which time you'd have to not only prove that you were safe and sober, but competent. So you'd have to deal with that. That's, that's the board's issue, but it's part of it. I would like to tell you that over the years we have reduced uh, the time that the board takes to deal with these cases. Our compliance standards have worked, and we've been doing this for a very long time. And because of confidentiality and increased awareness, we give you know, education to virtually every medical staff in the state and medical groups, uh, and that's brought us more members. Just to let you know what we have, we have 116 people, 83 MDs, 17% 17, uh, 17 MDs, PAs. Uh, Three-quarters male, one-quarter female, two-thirds confidential, one-third public. And, uh, and we have a success rate well documented in the 85 to 90 plus percent range over that five-year period. So we're really pleased. This, these stats do not include the dental board, other boards, uh, or agencies that we also provide these services for. Uh, most common specialties, uh, psychiatry, emergency medicine, anesthesia, most common drugs, alcohol, uh, synthetic opiates, including fentanyl. And we are unaware of any incident of patient harm to an active participant in our program in the 23 years we've been doing this. And I think we would find out. Uh, yes, please. You know, with reference to the concept of advocacy, <clears throat> can, you, can you hear me now? Okay. With reference to the concept of advocacy, advocacy is a secondary concern of ours. It's not our primary concern. Our primary concern is public safety and the protection of public safety. We do not rush to, uh, to put people back to work unless we feel in our bones and with all the quantitative and, and other information that we have uh, uh, on them to believe that truly they are safe to go back to work. So while the attorneys are trying to get you know, people to go back to work or the doctors complaining, et cetera, et cetera. We are a public safety program primarily, and number one, that is our priority. And that's very different than, uh, than the majority of other programs in the, in the United States. Thank you. Um, also, uh, we do have about half who have dual diagnosis with the conditions you see here. Uh, and then the physician health program component was added about six years ago to our duties. It was run internally prior to that. Includes all the conditions that you see there. Um, and that it is for the most part confidential, again, unless there are patient care issues or criminal issues. Um, and they really require evaluation and whatever type of treatment that they need. Um, we do get consultations. For example, we have a, a gentleman right now who's psychiatrically impaired. He has a psychiatrist who says he's fine and suffers from adjustment disorder. Four other psychiatrists say he has severe depression with paranoid ideation and is unsafe to practice. We have said, you cannot see that psychiatrist. You will see one of these three psychiatrists that we approve of. Uh, and he is not practicing at the present time. Uh, just to give you an idea, of, and you heard a little bit earlier about the models that exist, uh, we are a private contractor. We bid competitively for this contract currently every five years, uh, but there are board-operated models, medical association, and, and hybrids, 
And relationship, and this is an important thing to look at, and especially if you are looking at starting something new, that you'll want to have a close relationship with your PHP, regardless of the structure you provide. You know, you'll hear from Dr. Gunderson as well as from us that over many, many years we've built that level of trust and comfort and confidence and the ability to work together in both ways. Uh, funding, you heard a little bit about that too. Uh, in our state, we have gone from a subsidy by the medical board with a portion of a license fee uh, to no subsidy. That has has been gone completely for about eight years. It's full participant payment. We get no support from malpractice companies, hospitals, donors, anybody. We are in the process of setting up the Western States Professionals Health Foundation as a 501c3 to help fund care for needy physicians, PAs, residents, and to provide education and training and, and maybe other supports. That's actually in process as we speak. We're doing that in combination with the Nevada Professionals Program, but we intend for it to be available throughout the West, including uh, California. So our pay, and in most other programs, regardless of what you see about subsidy, participants typically pay for groups and drug testing on their own. And just over the years, again, uh, we, we have helped build the confidential program that didn't exist when we started doing this. Everybody was public, discipline or not. Uh, we've added the different levels of care. Drug testing has gotten better and better, uh, particularly with regard to alcohol testing. We, uh, toenails, nine to 12 months. We have a blood test that can tell if you've had six or more drinks in the prior three to four weeks. I mean, we, I mean, it's it's amazing uh, what we what we can do, um, and again, we uh, work with everyone. We believe we have a very strong program. Um, these are just some of the other agencies we work with, uh, here, and we work with our medical groups and hospitals here. I think I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you for that presentation. Very informative, and I know that my colleagues will have some questions and comments. Dr. Lewis. Yes, yeah, so you've given me a very, very complete history. I, I appreciate that I, I was not aware of most of, of what you do or these kind of programs out there. Since when I came on the board, we were, didn't have any kind of uh, physician health program. Um, I'm also encouraged with your comments about confidentiality. You have that safe haven sort of, you know, box that they sort of can be in, but it's consumer protection is always surrounding that safe haven, for, and that's very encouraging because I think people may be critical of where oh, it's confidential, no one's going to find out, and maybe you can comment more about how strong that that is, that safe haven and the protection part. Well, it's really a gift, and uh, we worked hard to get that established because it's more likely you'll get help if you're confidential. It's a medical condition, like any chronic condition. The earlier you diagnose and treat it, the more likely you are to do well. It's helped encourage people to come forward, but they also know that if they don't stay the course, that there will be discipline, it will be public, and there are significant consequences. You know, years ago, probation, while never good, was not particularly a big deal. But today, you know, Try getting malpractice insurance. Try getting on a health plan panel. Try getting hospital privileges when you're on probation. Much more difficult. No, I th thank you for your comment. Yeah, right. Well, Dr. Levine. Thank you. That was terrific. You mentioned briefly in the beginning aging physicians. I think it was one on your early slides. And, um, I, and I know you didn't have time to address it here, but... You know, I think, I think the statistics are that almost 27% of the physicians practicing in this, oops. God, somebody didn't like my question. <laughs> um, almost 27% of practicing physicians, according to the AMA database, are over the age of 65. Yes. Um, and I'm wondering what are, whether you're doing screening, whether you're assisting institutions with, the, the or is it just a referral? Well, the medical board per se, is, unless it's a direct referral for that, which is not so common, has not really addressed it, although I believe they're going to be addressing it. Most of this comes from hospitals and medical staffs, and we are working with Banner Health, Honor Health, Dignity Health, which are the three large systems, looking at 
you know, where's the age, but doing cognitive screening and a history and physical at reappointment time, or obviously if there's an issue that arises. And, and the reason for my question is we've, we've had a presentation in the past about how difficult it is because there aren't normative results for physicians um, in terms of neurocognitive testing, that most of the norms are set um, for the average population. And so it's hard to demonstrate, when somebody um, performs at an average level, it's hard to establish because you don't have a baseline whether it represents a cognitive decline. And I wondered if you found tools that actually um, can identify that. Yeah, that, that's a very good point, and in fact, um, we've been able to get uh, neuropsych testing that doesn't, it's not specifically correlated to, to cohorts of physicians, but it is uh, correlated to educational level of training. And so that's not, as, that's not perfect, but I think that the, the neuropsych is starting to go in that right direction, and that's important as far as making a good decision. And similarly, we've also made good use of PACE down in San Diego to help with, when it comes to competence or technical issues as well. But it, it's coming. You're, you're right, totally. Uh, I'll just to go to the left and go to the right. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Yaroslavsky? Thank you very much for your um, presentation. I, um, I've, heard it I've heard some of this information before, but it's always, for me, very good to hear it again. Uh, it's very informative, but I had a question, not to compare apples and oranges, but uh, uh, apples and apples or anything, but how many doctors are licensed in the state of Arizona? I think somewhere around 20,000, and probably around 12,000 or 15, 12 to 15 actually living and practicing in Arizona. And of those, um, how many are at any, in a given year under any kind of rules, the regulations with discipline? Remediation, whatever you'd like to call it. Well, for our program. No, just in general. In, in general, I don't know. So you don't know what percentage of the impaired physicians are part of your program? Oh, no, I do know that. So, I, I, I thought you were asking me a different. Well, you have 116 uh, participants. Right. But I, out of the. That's about 1%. So uh, if there's 12,000 physicians in Arizona practicing, we're at 116 today. Uh, so that's just a touch under 1%. But you don't know how many. Or any participating in remediation of dis discipline cases? Not well, a one third of them were disciplined, two thirds were confidential at the No, present. no, not within your program, just in general. Oh, in Quality gen of care. Uh, I, do, I do not, general. I don't have that information. I can tell you that typically 0.5 to 2% of the active physician population are in a monitoring program for addiction or substance use disorders at any point in time. Uh, you know, there's a lifetime prevalence in the 12 to 15 percent range, but at any point in time, 0.5 to 2 percent are in a program. And what is your annual budget? Our annual budget is probably, for this program, probably around $800,000, eight, maybe eight to 900000 And I heard you say it was paid for by, by participants? Correct. Oh, okay. Dr. Krauss? Thank you for your presentation. Um, I notice uh, in your later slides you already are doing some private work in California for hospitals and, and medical groups. And you also noted that in some states you have an antagonistic relationship with the medical board. Is we, that us? We don't. No, 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 no. We don't have an antagonistic relationship. We have a close relationship, but some other PHPs have distant or antagonistic relationships with their boards. So you heard uh, earlier, you know, that 11 of the programs don't have a contract, which means they may only have verbal understanding. It may vary by employee. We believe in having a close relationship, in fact, a partnership with the boards and, and the, here in California, Sutter, Kaiser, uh, St. Joe's, I mean, uh, California emergency physicians who are amongst our clients, um, there, we're partners in how we work on this. We would do that here as well. I mean, and we, I speak to Kim, what, monthly or so about something. So. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Go Dr. Yip, did you have? Um, what, what experience is showing in the past? Any stay in the medical board, associate that invites you to go to their state to set up shops or 
in a consulting basis. For example, let's say our agency today, with the, without the CMA and ask you to come in as a consultant or come in shop of shops, uh, want to have a program, get started in three months, six months, what, what was the experience in the past with that? Uh, well, we have quite a bit of experience, uh, and we'd be happy to help in any way we could. I mean, we have set up uh, programs at a number of the evaluation and treatment centers here in, in California and in Arizona, and we've consulted with other new programs. Uh, Georgia recently started a physician's health program after many years of not having one. So, and, and we're a fairly small family of, of people that do this type of work. And we are, unlike many other states where they're confined to a particular mission for a patient population in a given state, we don't have those constraints. And uh, Dr. Greenberg grew up in California, in fact, right here in the Bay Area. I live in Southern California half the time. Uh, we're very much involved in this state. Thank you. Have, have, I'm just, have you seen a conflict between like the medical board and the local medical association? Since they're more pro-doctor, we're more pro-public, but we want to work the same goal. One of the issues that is related to that, uh, doctor, that's very important is this, is that uh, programs around the country that take money from malpractice corporations and big hospitals and, and uh, trade associations uh, don't do that without uh, being leaned on in the future by the donors of the uh, the, uh, th those, th those types of funds. And so we, uh, we respect our medical societies, but we're not seeking funds from them or support from them in that fashion. And we believe it's better to be independent and respectful of each other. Dr. Ganadev. Yeah, I got two questions. One is uh, you said there, are, there is increase in referrals. Can you quantify that? I want to know what it was before the program started What's the increase and what's the, how, how did it? Uh, well, I think that since we had uh, the advent of confidentiality, probably referrals have gone from maybe 10 or 15 a year up to 25 a year. So that's a you know, 30, 40% increase since the advent of confidentiality with that first opportunity uh, with treatment and monitoring. My second one is that it, you said the program is, uh, budget is about $800,000 and you got about 113 or 14 doctors. That's about close to $80,000 per year or 75 or something it, uh, per person. Is that right? Uh, no. Uh, the average, the cost of the program is roughly around ten dollars to $12,000 per year, including monitoring relapse prevention group, and drug testing. Um, so that would be, if you took 10,000 times uh, 116, you'd be at about 1.2 million. Uh, but uh, there are a substantial number of people who don't pay, can't pay, mm -hmm. or pay less, and we, uh, we work payment plans out with people. Dr. Hawkins, did you have a comment? Did I see? No, thank you. Anybody else to my right has a comment or question? No, seeing none, thank you so much for that presentation. Very informative. I do have sp speaker cards. Uh, Julie D'Angelo Felmuth. It's fine, it's fine, it's fine. Good afternoon, Julie D'Angelo Felmuth. I'm the Administrative Director of the Center for Public Interest Law and I'm also the former Medical Board Enforcement Monitor. Um, thanks to Dr. Sucher and Dr. Greenberg for that presentation. I've heard them speak many times over about the past 15 years, and I appreciate the increasing sophistication of their program. However, Ms. Yaroslavsky makes some very good points. California has at least six times as many doctors as Arizona does. California is three times the geographical size of Arizona, and that's a, a huge consideration. And the California program, even at its worst, had double the number of participants as the Arizona program does. And that was, even that was the tip of the addiction iceberg. So I just want to give you a little bit of background information about California's experience with diversion or a physician health program. And I, I will warn you that this is not a topic that's amenable to a three-minute public comment. Um, as Ms. Robinson to told you, minutes. I will try. No, you will have to keep it under three minutes. If, Thank if you. I don't, I'll just pick it up tomorrow with okay, Dr. Gunderson. Okay, that'd be fine. 
Um, as Ms. Robinson told you, this board did have a diversion program for 27 years for substance abusing physicians. That was an in-house program run by medical board employees who were assisted by dozens and dozens of on-the-ground people who would do things like collect urine samples and send them off to the lab and, and conduct group meetings uh, for participants and um, act as workplace, work site monitors when a participant was allowed to return to work. The program was overseen not by this board, but by a liaison committee convened by the California Medical Association, the California Society of Addiction Medicine, and the California Psychiatric Association. Um, during the 27-year time period, that program was externally audited five times. And unlike the Arizona program, it failed all five audits miserably. I conducted the fourth of those five audits. And before you even consider creating any kind of a program, I urge you to read chapter 13 of the initial report of the Medical Board Enforcement Monitor dated November 1, 2004. The report is available on your website and on CPIL's website, cpil.org. Um, and it documents serious problems in the diversion program. After the fifth failed audit, which occurred in 2007, this board unanimously voted to abolish the diversion program effective June 30th, 2008. Since that time, the California Medical Association and others have attempted at least five pieces of legislation, possibly more, I, I don't even remember, to recreate some kind of a program. All of those bills were defeated or dropped because they largely sought to replicate that old program or to allow the same people and the same organizations who oversaw the old program to oversee the new program. Now, as enforcement monitor, I did not recommend abolishing the diversion program. You may be surprised to learn that. I did recommend abolishing the program after the fifth failed audit, but as the monitor, I did not recommend abolishing the program. However, I recommended that this board do some deep thinking about several fundamental issues. One, 30 more seconds. Is the diversion concept diverting into a secret program of perhaps the most dangerous physicians out there for confidential monitoring, using monitoring mechanisms that are demonstrably, demonstrably failing, is that consistent with your public protection mandate? Two, if it is, whether that program should be located within the medical board. We found that the location of the program within the medical board was a deterrent to doctors entering the program. And finally, if the board decided to continue or the program, it needed to completely restructure the program in order to um, ensure that it is effective in monitoring substance abusing physicians and in protecting patients from those physicians. We have no Julie, problem. Julie, yes. as a matter of fairness, I'd like to give everybody three minutes. You've I'm had fine more. with that. I'll pick it up tomorrow. Thank you. Thank I you. appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker is James O'Donnell. Did I get that right? James? And then after James, um, Michelle uh, Moserat Ramos. Sir, if you could just. Is this a place to we prefer that one there. Thank you. Uh, thank you, the chairman and the board. Uh, for letting me make some comments. Uh, my experience with uh, impaired doctors started about 32 years ago, and I am a independent contractor with the Pacific Assistance Group. I'm a group facilitator in the San Francisco Bay Area uh, for them. Uh, the group facilitator it's a part of the quality control in terms of watching doctors very carefully in terms of their, of their attitude, in terms of how they're doing in recovery. Uh, they meet with me at least once or twice a week for five years. Uh, I've seen hundreds of doctors during that period, and I, I have a pretty good sense of, well, my job is to assess and to report on their attitude, on their quality of recovery, on uh, any mental, uh, mental relapses that are going on and physical relapses. So I'm half uh, assessment person and half support. These physicians come into the program uh, decimated as human beings and for, for good reason because of their chemical dependency history. 
uh, within a year you see improvement day after day after day and eventually uh, at the end of five years uh, most of them are very whole high functioning individuals. Now uh, in terms of my experience over the years, uh, I started with uh, Occupational Health Services. I was a co-founder of that organization that started the diversion programs for other than the medical board, all the pharmacy boards, the, the dental board, and so on and so forth. So I was sort of in on the design phase of that. Uh, and, uh, and then eventually uh, that organization sort of morphed into Maximus. So I also worked with uh, Maximus clients. Uh, and, and then, of course, a Pacific Assistance uh, a clients. So basically during that period, I cannot remember of any a physician uh, that was charged with negligence or gross negligence in terms of, of their practice. In fact, uh, the original diversion program, uh, they did a survey and found that the doctors in diversion at that time, as compared to the general uh, population of doctors in the state of California had less complaints. And why is that? Because these individuals know that this is their last chance. And so they tend to be very careful in terms of their judgments, in terms of their, their uh, professional um, treating of patients, etc. cetera. So uh, 32 years of experience has shown me that these programs work, either with Maximus or with Pacific Assistance Group. I'm, I'm an independent contractor, by the way, uh, at this, at this point conclude. in my career. And it, it is so gratifying to see the physicians that, that, that leave, all right, the diversion programs and the leadership positions that they, they um, take up in their hospitals or their communities. At Stanford University, I have, uh, there was one doctor that graduated successful. successfully. He's on the wellness committee of that particular institution. I have a, another physician, world famous in his specialty, and he Please graduated. Please conclude your comments. Oh, what's that? Please conclude. The, the, oh, when the, okay. When, when the red light's on, you've okay, reached the three-minute mark. Okay, very good. I'm just, I'm, I'm through. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for your comments, sir. We appreciate that. Thank you. Michelle Maserat Ramos. Um, as most of you know, my late fiance died at 36 years of age at the hands of a doctor addicted to crack cocaine. We've made some progress here with the end of diversion. Why did the NBC abolish it? Because the board agreed that you are putting Californians at risk. I just talked to you about an example of a doctor on probation. This doctor had a 25-year history of substance abuse. This doctor did enter the diversion program. Why? Because of multiple arrests. He, ent he entered rehab and left three days later. His continuous arrests put him in a jail cell for eight months. While all of this criminal activity is happening, a woman died while under his care. There were other judgments found on this doctor on your website, the NBC site. The board gave him his license back and he violated probation six to seven months later. Why? Because he refused biological fluid testing. He didn't refuse one test, not two tests. He refused six biological fluid tests. This is a story of how the diversion program works. It is a threat to patient safety. Let's continue with our progress with uniform standards. No to diversion, yes to patient safety. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Karen Miato. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. 
My name is Karen Miato, and I'm the chair of the Physicians' Wellbeing Committee at UCLA. Monthly, I talk to the other chairs in the medical schools up and down the state. So I'm very familiar with the struggles of physicians and our current approach to trying to provide care and monitoring for them. I've referred physicians to other states, and I also am a member of the Federation of Physician Health Programs. I want to strongly advocate for a program to help the physicians in the state of California. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Uh, the next speaker card is Dr. Tracy Zemanski. Hello. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Tracy Zemanski. I'm a clinical psychologist in private practice, and I'm the current president of Pacific Assistance Group. We have 15 cities throughout the state of California where we are doing private monitoring under very structured guidelines, primarily set by the Federation of State Physician Health Programs. We have approximately 200 participants in this private program right now. And I'm very heartened to see that all of us here today um, are really looking for what will best provide public safety and I strongly believe that having options for physicians who have problems, which there will always be some, having options for physicians to get the help they need will best protect the public as opposed to having only enforcement, which can, by the nature of enforcement, can only come after the fact of something happening. Um, there is a significant body of research on the effectiveness of the PHP models, including strong early intervention options, primarily before enforcement, as well as options after monitoring with enforcement, like Dr. Dr. Sutcher described. Um, Pacific Assistance Group is willing to work with the board and any of the other interested parties in any way we can both to provide our experience. I've been doing this since 1998. I have experience working with state program as well as private program, and there are some real advantages and limitations of each, and having a confidential track as well as a very strong structured support and monitoring track with enforcement is probably the best possible way. True recovery which is what best protects the citizens of our state, goes far beyond monitoring or abstinence only. A state-recognized physician health program can provide this where, unfortunately, enforcement cannot. I would invite you all to join together with us and other interested parties to support public safety through early intervention options along with current monitoring. Thank you. Yeah, um, Dr. Levine? One quick question. Uh, just a point of information. Does, does um, PAG serve uh, clients from other states, or is it just California? We have referrals from other states when physicians that are being monitored there come to California. We will do a very uh, seamless transition if there's a physician in California who's in our monitoring program, generally for five years, if they're going to another state so that we facilitate that there's no gaps in testing, there's no gaps in worksite monitoring, or that the program in that state knows very well who they're getting and what they've done so far for their rehabilitation. But your primary client relationships are all California physicians. We are all in California. Most of us worked with the state program running groups before that. Thank you. Thank you, for, thank, thank you for your comments. They're greatly appreciated. If there's no more comments from the members, uh, the public present, I'll ask if there's any comments from the phone on agenda item five. Thank you. And ladies and gentlemen on the phone, if you have a question, please press star followed by one. And we'll go to the line of Susan Sinese. She's a private citizen. Your line is open, Ms. Sinese. Please go ahead. Ms. Hi, this is Susan Sinese. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, I just wanted to make a comment on the, um, which sounds like a diversion program that uh, people have been speaking about. 
And I just want to say that um, as physicians are the most highly educated in medical um, in healthcare, I think that they should stand up and lead the way for our culture in making it acceptable to admit to addictions and to get help. There should be no secrecy. They deal with human lives, and secrecy in medicine has always led to problems. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are there no further questions in queue at this time? Thank you. Seeing no further public comment, we'll continue this till tomorrow where we have a presentation from the Colorado uh, State Medical Board. We'll now move to item six, discussion and possible action on legislation and regulations. Ms. Samos. Thank you. Um, first, I would like to report that I've contacted all legislative offices in the Bay Area and invited them to attend this meeting. So you should have a, tra please refer to your legislative packets in the tracker list. On your tracker list, the bills in blue are either two-year bills or bills we have already taken positions on. Um, so we will not need to go over the bills at this time unless any members have questions. And you can see quite a few um, bills have turned into two-year bills this year. Um, the bills in pink are board sponsor bills, so we will go over those first and then go on to the bills in green. Just as a quick aside, I just wanted to let you know that um, many of the scope bills have turned into two-year bills. So the CNM scope bill, the in nurse practitioner scope bill, the optometrist scope bill. At issue for the two nurse scope bills, um, the ban on the corporate practice of medicine turned out to be a huge issue. So we'll um, likely hear more about that next year. One, one policy committee had one opinion and the other one had another opinion, so it kind of um, caused those bills to stall this year. Which bill was that? I didn't hear you. Both bills, um, AB 1306 and SB 323, um, the ban on the corporate practice of medicine basically was the reason why both those bills stalled. So okay. just as a heads up, that issue might come up next year. Okay, so moving on to the first bill in pink, SB 396. This is the um, outpatient settings bill that the board's been a um, strong supporter of. Um, we did get some opposition from various groups, and um, we kind of had to have a sit down with the opposition and Senator Hill and um, our staff and kind of negotiate what, we what it would take for the bill to basically move. And so we had to take some things out of that bill. So the first thing we had to take out was the data reporting to OSHPED. Um, it wasn't going to go forward this year. So basically, um, Senator Hill promised that that was an issue that's going to come up in our sunset. And so it's something that we will continue to work on, but it just won't be included in SB 396. Um, secondly, we had to take some amendments to the unannounced visits. And so instead of requiring an, a subsequent, un, subsequent inspections to be unannounced, now basically they're, it allows the accreditation agencies to make those visits unannounced if they decide to do that. And if they do decide to make them unannounced, they have to provide a 60-day window to the facility. So that was a negotiation that we took. Um, and the reasoning for that is it leaves it in the hands of the accreditation agency to decide whether or not it should be unannounced. But then that outpatient setting would still get a 60-day window. So it's better than what we have now, which is announced, but it's not a requirement for unannounced. So um, we're left with the, the peer review and the unannounced are basically the two provisions that we still have in that bill. Um, as you may remember, there was a, a requirement and there actually would have allowed um, facilities to apply for CDPH for licensure, um, and that was actually taken out of the bill. Um, and so the only thing that remains, we have the um, VE report, that, that delayed date, that's still in there. And then um, allowing an accredited outpatient setting to access 805 reports, um, that's still in there. And so it's moving, it's on the assembly floor, and, um, and there's no opposition to the bill now. Um, the next bill, the midwife assistant bill, no changes, um, and it's on the assembly floor. It's received no, no votes, and so it's moving along nicely. Um, the next bill is our omnibus bill. Um, I'm not going to, these are, sure, okay. Um, so these are, SB 800 is our omnibus bill. Okay. Okay, SB 800, the omnibus bill. Please. And that. Ms. Yaroslavsky, if you can direct your questions to the chair as it relates to staff. I was having a hard time following the race that was going on. I understand. So I just, before the next breath was taken, Thank I you. tried to slow. I understand. Okay. Is everyone with me, SB 800? 
Okay, that's our omnibus bill, and that's the bill that in includes a technical clarifying um, language that the boards, um, we've already gone over this. The only change to this one is we had included language that would have allowed, um, that would have clarified in statute that the board um, can basically, um, for allied healthcare professionals, put them on probation, allow them to apply for reinstatement. It wasn't exactly clear in the law, even though it's something that we're doing. And so, um, those amendments were put in the bill, but then they were thought to be too substantial by some of legislative staff, so they were taken out. And so basically what we're going to need to do next year is have a big bill that includes all of our technical clarifying changes or things that are maybe a little bit too substantial to put in omnibus. Anything that we think needs to be changes are made more clear, and we're just going to have a big... Um, it would be kind of like an omnibus bill, but it would include everything that we need. An omnibus has to meet a lot of requirements. Basically, everyone has to say that it's not substantial and everyone has to agree. So the Republican caucus has to agree. Both sides have to agree. And in this case, some of, um, some of the things that we needed, they thought was too substantial, so they got taken out. So next year, our plan is to work with staff and identify all the changes that we think we need to to make sure we have authority to do everything we need to do, and we're going to put forth a large bill. So I'll be working with all the program staff, licensing, enforcement, to make sure that we have all the changes we need into one large bill that we'll be bringing next year to you. Members, do you have Ms. Yaroslavsky? Yeah. What I'm hearing is, is that there were things that were too substantial to get this bill to move forward. No. But next year, we're going to make sure that we have more discussions and less substantiality? I mean, what, no, I mean so what, what happens is omnibus bill is a bill that is carried by the BMP committee, and everyone has to agree that the changes in it are just technical clarifying changes. And so when I say everyone, I mean staff from the BMP committees, staff from the Republican caucus that staffs those committees. In this case, the BMP committee agreed to put it in, but the Republican caucus thought they were too substantial, so they were taken out. Meaning too substantial, meaning having too much... Meaning, basically, they didn't think they were just technical and clarifying changes. Okay, so it's okay. That's so. What I so what we're going to do this time next year is we're going to have to find an author, and it won't be a BMP committee bill because it won't meet those technical clarifying requirements. And we'll include everything that we think that we need to include, and then it will go forward as a normal bill. It won't be an omnibus bill. And so that's our plan for next year. And I'll be bringing all those um, board-sponsored things to the board at the next board meeting. And so it still includes the, the technical clarifying changes, just those, those items that I mentioned, the pro, pro, probation and reinstatement were taken out. Uh, yes. On the, <clears throat> on the outpatient uh, surgery centers bill, mm -hmm. uh, un unannounced within 60 day period, that's what is in there now? Yeah, so basically now what it says is it may, the, the subsequent inspection may be unannounced, so it leaves it up to the accreditation agency to determine if it's going to be unannounced or not. But if it is unannounced, then the accreditation agency has to provide a 60-day window to that outpatient setting. And so sometime in the next 60 days. So they won't be giving them the exact date like they do now, but they'll be giving them more of a window. And that was one of the negotiations that we had to, to take through the process. Just my, my opinion is that if we just took that, would have been fine, but the agency deciding whether it is going to be announced or not, that doesn't uh, make a lot of sense in my mind. But, but Yeah, that's actually um, what we offered, but that wasn't going to fly with that. So <laughs> we had to take it one step further, unfortunately. But. Colleagues, okay. are there any additional questions or comments on the board's sponsored bills? Those are the ones in pink that we just got a report on. Seeing none, we'll now move, if Ms. Smoes, to the green, the ones in, highlighted in green? Correct. That where, you're, where we're seeking action on each bill. Yes. Thank you. It's either action or an update. Okay. So AB 266, this is one of the medical marijuana bills. Um, there's been a lot of movement with these bills. So if you remember, AB 26 was merged into AB 34, which we took a supportive amended position. Now, now those AB 34 has been merged with AB 266, and what this means is basically the law enforcement supported bill and the industry supported bill have merged into this bill, AB 266. And so um, basically it includes all of the things that all the bills have included, and so the stuff we've supported before, like, um, like it requires, um, so basically, 
It adds it into our priorities, like it did before. It, required, it adds it into the prescribing 2242, so they have to have an appropriate prior, prior exam, but it does not require the physical exam, which is a piece that the board had wanted before. Um, it, it, it includes some of the um, advertising and not allowing um, a facility to employ a physician. Um, it, it, it requires, um, pro prohibits a physician from recommending cannabis to a patient unless that patient is a patient's attending physician. And if you remember, that was in some other versions of the bill. An attending physician is uh, defined in health and safety code. Um, and it would also require the board to consult with the California Marijuana Research Program, known as the California Center for Medicinal Cannabis Research on Developing and Adopting Guidelines, and that was been in other bills before. As you know, we already have a, a statement online, and so we would update that. If this bill were to pass, then we would, would have them review that statement. Um, so it, bills in the past, AB 26 and AB 34, included all of these provisions. AB 26 required an an actual in-person exam, and so we supported that. AB 34 required all these provisions, but it didn't require an in-person exam, so we took a supportive amended position. And so um, our previous position before the amendments on um, this bill was neutral. Staff is suggesting because it included all the provisions of the other bills that we supported, that we also support this bill. This is, seems to be the bill that's moving through the legislature that kind of all parties have agreed on. It still does not include an in-person exam, I have to tell you, I'm going to have trouble getting an in-person exam in there because um, there's a lot of people that don't support an in-person exam. So if they take that amendment that I'm requesting, they bring on people that are opposed. Um, so staff is suggesting a support position, but it's up to the board. Ms. Yaroslavsky? So I have a question, um, a couple questions. Mm -hmm. One is it takes out, it does not allow for doctors to be employed by the dispensary, is that correct? Mm-hmm which is a good, important thing. Mm -hmm. The issue then becomes with the good faith exam is, okay. is it a good faith exam in person or is it a good faith exam? It's no exam. It's just an appropriate prior exam. So that's what's in law now, is an appropriate prior right. exam. It doesn't say whether it has to be in person or not. It just, it adds it to 2242 as an appropriate prior exam. So the appropriate prior exam is part of what the rules and regs are now for us in general, correct? Yes. So if that's the rules and what we go under now, why is there a con why are you feeling that there's a conflict? Well, when, and when, I don't know if you if you remember last time when we talked about AB 34. I don't remember. I apologize. Um, it was all the same things of this, but there were some issues that the board had, and they wanted actually you you wanted um, not you specifically, Me but specifically? the board. The board wanted the in-person exam. So the final position that we took was support if amended, and the amendment being to add in back in the in-person exam language. I was unsuccessful in getting that language in because if they would have taken that language that we were requesting, they would have brought on opposition by others. So they left it as it was. We remain supportive amended, although that bill changed to a two-year bill because now it's everyone's on so this that, No, I understand. I just want to be clear because, I mean, this, this is something I, I hear about all the time. I just yeah. want to be clear so that if a doctor today prescribes a, an antibiotic, the quality of care or the responsibility of the doctor is this exactly the same as this. Appropriate correct? prior exam, correct. So I just make sure. So I'm fine. Thank you. Dr. Krauss and then Dr. Ganondev. May I ask Jennifer if the substance of this bill is making it more restrictive for a physician to issue a marijuana recommendation? Or is much of this a reiteration of current law? It's a reiteration of current law, except for right now, um, it's not clear that 2242 applies to recommendations for medical marijuana. There's been some court cases that make it not clear. And so for us in the past, it has been important to add it to 2242 to make it clear that 2242 also applies to recommendations for marijuana. So this bill does add recommendations to 2242 which is important for enforcement um, reasons for the board. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Jennifer, you mentioned that uh, this allows only patients attending physician by, by our statute to really be able to prescribe medical marijuana. Am I hearing it right? That's correct. And so it, it, it's a... Um, provision in the health and safety code, and I can read the definition of attending physician if that helps, no. 
No, I, I, okay. I think that's, that's great because my concern is that some either extreme age doctor sitting in a clinic and uh, writing prescriptions, that's what my concern was, and this takes that away. So it, it's wonderful. Are there any additional comments from the members? Uh, Ms. Yaroslav, I'm sorry, Dr. Krause. I'm Dr. Lewis. I'm make a motion. Yes, sir. I'm going to make a motion to recommend support of AB266. Is there a second? Second. No further dialogue. Are there any comments uh, from the audience? AB266. Any comments from the phone? And once again on the phone, if you have a question, please press star one. And no comments from the phone. Thank you. Ms. Toof, please call the roll. Dr. Bolat? Yay. Dr. Bishop? Aye. Dr. Gonadev? Aye. Dr. Hawkins? Aye. Dr. Krause? Abstain. Dr. Levine? Aye. Dr. Lewis? Aye. Ms. Pines? Aye. Ms. Shipsky? Ms. Wright? Aye. Ms. Jaroslavsky? Aye. Dr. Yip? Aye. Mr. Serrano Sewell? Aye. Motion carries. Next bill. All right, moving on to AB 483 Patterson. If you remember, this is the bill that would have required the board to prorate the initial licensing fees for physicians and surgeons. Um, the board actually requested, took a neutral amended position and requested that the board be removed from this bill um, and that those amendments were taken. And so because, um, because those amendments were taken, the board now has a neutral position on this bill. So this is really just an update. Are there any questions from the members? If not, is there a motion? Do we need one? I apologize. No motion. All right, on to the next one. Okay. Thank you. And the next one is AB 684 Bonilla. And um, this is the bill that includes language that place a moratorium on discipline for registered dispensing opticians and optometrists by the medical board and the California Board of Optometry for engaging in any business relationship prohibited by existing law. As you may remember that the last meeting, the board took a neutral if amended position and we asked for some amendments to basically um, prohibit new businesses from coming to California um, after just because the moratorium was in effect. And so basically the language was taken to say you have to have been registered um, before the effective date of the bill. And so those amendments were taken. And so the board is now neutral. Just as an aside, there's some discussions going on to try to put more language in this regarding the business um, arrange business relationships. Um, Kim and I have and Carrie have been attending meetings at the you know at the governor's office and there's a lot of um, language going around but it wasn't at the point where I could bring it to the board because it's um, just really really in draft format so there are there are discussions and if if um, if it becomes in bill form then we may have to have an emergency teleconference executive committee meeting because it will be something we need to take a position on but at this point um, it's still just the moratorium and we're neutral thank you are there any questions dr. Krause I always learn something from looking to see who supports and who opposes. Mm -hmm. uh, and the support here is coming from large corporations that are in the business of selling eyeglasses. And the opposition is from those associations that represent the small business owners. So um, this bill would tend to potentially harm the consumer uh, in giving um, advantages to large corporations and disadvantages to small businesses. It becomes our business because we're the body that uh, regulates dispensing opticians. Um, so it causes me unease, but I don't know that uh, this is a battle that we need to fight. Just, just for a little background, this bill is not sponsored by um any of those parties, Assemblymember Bonilla's office has made it really clear that the whole reason for this moratorium is for to get interested parties together to, number one, decide if there can be a solution, and if there's not, to give boards like our board the time to ramp up and be ready to um, actively um, enforce the existing law. And so it's not sponsored by one side or the other. That is really the reasoning for it. Um, Assemblymember Bonilla has made um, you know, commitments and committees and policy committees to try to bring the parties together and see if there's going to be some kind of solution. If there is, this will be the vehicle. It used to be AB 595, but that became a two-year bill. It's unclear whether that's going to happen this year, but they're actively trying. We've been in meetings. Is, 
you know, this week on it, and there's more set up for next week. So, um, you know, the, the governor's office is kind of taking the lead on this and really working to come up with some kind of resolution, but at this point in time, it's still just the moratorium. So I think neutral is a good position for us to be in, and we are continuing to actively participate on this subject. So you're not seeking, you're not seeking action at this, no. at this time? All right. Okay, so the next bill, AB 773 Baker, um, this is before I talked about the bill that would have required us to prorate initial licensing fees. Um, when we requested be taken out of that bill, we basically committed to being added to this bill. And this would be, instead of a birth date renewal, it would be a two-year license renewal. So both of them try to get at the issue of overcharging licensees. And this one would basically say when you apply for a license, it's a straight two-year license. We think it makes more sense um, for us to be able to implement. Um, and makes more sense for licensees not resulting in delays. And so we um, took a supportive amended position and asked to be added to the bill. We have been added to the bill, so our position is now a support. And so that's just an update. Are there any questions, comments from the members? Okay, thank you. Okay. Next item. Um, the next bill um, that's going to require some discussion is SB 337 Pavley. And this is the bill that would establish alternative means for a supervising physician to ensure adequate supervision of a PA. Um, basically, it adds two additional mechanisms. In addition to the existing 5% medical record countersign requirement, for a supervising physician to choose from to ensure adequate PA supervision. You probably remember we talked about this bill last time. We had some concerns with one of the mechanisms because it would allow um, a physician to basically um, decide what was appropriate and it didn't put many parameters and so we asked that there be a base basically that they require so many you know meetings or visits with the um, supervising physician. So changes were made to, to respond to our um, you know, request. And so now it basically says a supervising physician shall supervise the care provided by the PA through a review of cases involving treatment by the PA functioning under protocols adopted by the physician. The review methods used shall be identified in the delegation of services agreement and shall include no less than an aggregate of 10 cases per month for at least 10 months of the year. So that 10 cases per month and 10 months of a year are the base that we really requested. Um, we took an opposing less amended position, and our one remaining concern that has not been addressed is um, the Schedule II drug orders. So existing law requires 100% of the Schedule II drug orders to be um, signed by a supervising physician. This changes it to 20%. It does require that the PA take courses and education. Um, and so, you know, the intent of this bill is to provide flexibility and allow for a more team-based approach, which I think everyone can agree is a good thing. Um, although it still reduces the physician of medical records um, for Schedule II drug orders from 100 to 20 percent, the supervising physician will be responsible for choosing the 20 percent of the drug orders that get signed, and these records could p potentially be discussed at the medical record review meetings or case reviews that are now required by this bill. Um, so. I think that they've addressed a lot of our concerns. We have this one remaining concern about the drug orders. Because I didn't, we didn't get a lot of feedback on what exactly would fix this concern, I haven't been able to give them amendments to say like, okay, we have this concern, but here are some amendments that will fix it. And so we kind of have two options today. We could change from a neutral position using that because there's these team-based approaches that you, the physicians will choose those 20% of cases and they could be a subject to this team approach. Or we can, we have to actually say this, this is what would make us okay with the 20% sign off. Part of the um, reason that they're changing this 20% according to the sponsors is because the rescheduling of hydrocodone has really increased the number of Schedule II drug orders. And so there's a lot of arguments on both sides and I, I'm sure that um, the sponsor will come up and talk. But, you know, we're kind of the last remaining organization that has an issue with this bill. Um, and... Looking at it again, staff, um, and I'm not a physician, but doesn't have as many concerns because the physician will actually have to select those 20%. And we have this new mechanism for a medical records review meeting and a case review meeting where the physician and the PA can actually sit down and have a team-based approach. So staff is suggesting because of that that we take a neutral position, but it's the board's call whether or not we want to actually come up with language to address that, that Schedule II drug order issue or if we want to be okay with the bill in its current form. Yes, Mr. 
So I have a clarifying question. Mm -hmm. uh, it sounds to me like some significant changes were taken. Yes. And the issue being that if out of 10 months a year that the PA and the supervising physician have to have a conversation and a review on a monthly basis of a certain number of cases, that that seems almost like a roundabout opportunity, a roundabout method to do what we were trying to get done. So I could be wrong, but I, I, I kind of feel that that in order of, not to take any hostages and not to make out, oh, yes, we're going to do it, it sounds to me like from what you've explained and from what I've read, that they've pretty much done what we've asked. I could be, I, I'm. I, mean, I, I think that's how staff interprets it. They've done what we've asked, but the only thing that we um, had, a, we relayed as a concern that wasn't addressed was the 20%, but I didn't have enough information to say this is what would make us okay with the bill, which makes it hard because they want to address our concern, but the only thing would be to take out that section, which is really important to them. And so I think with the uh, medical records review meeting, it's either, it, they have to either choose the medical records review meeting or um, the ca review of cases, and both of those have to be 10 10 cases at least 10 months of the year. So either of these options that are new would basically require that. And so I think even though we're going down to 20%, requiring the physician to actually pick those 20% and allow an avenue for them to talk about them with the, with the PA is, I think that's um, sufficient to ensure consumer protection. But I mean, it's up to the board on, on what they want to do. Thank so you. I just want to just further, just one sure. real quick. So. Is it staff's opinion or are there expert opinions that it's a certain percentage would make it better? The 10 percent is, it should be really 12 percent? It should really be, a, you know, I'm, I'm starting to worry that we're going to micromanage and we're going to lose our opportunity to get into this legislation, something that really will be beneficial. That's so it's 20 percent now, and I, the, I would invite the sponsors will probably come up public comment. They have, uh, My it, I wasn't aware they that. passed out um, literature, I believe, last time on the reason why they came up with the 20 percent, um, and Dr. Bishop may have some insight because he supervises PAs, uh, or he's on the PA board too, so um, I'm not a physician, so... So, Ms. Yaroslavsky, uh, Jennifer and I have really looked at this, and we've gone back and forth, and um, we did get a lot of literature from Ms. Anderson that we reviewed, and we think at this point, because we because we're not physicians, we don't have another number, and we think that 20% actually, based on their literature, is an appropriate number, and I think we should move it forward. Sorry, sorry. Okay. I apologize. Uh, Dr. Lewis? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm wondering if we're spending a lot of time on this, and we, we have what we want, so I'm... I'm wondering why we are not really just supporting it. I think the 20% seems reasonable. The physician is ultimately responsible for all those prescriptions in effect, right? And so yes. I, I don't know why we're not just going ahead and supporting it. We've and got we all we want to And we definitely can get. support it. We were kind of an opposed, so I was taking middle ground but before, but if they've taken our amendments, we could, our choice is basically well, our neutral or support. I'd like to move that we support this bill. Um, which is uh, SB 337. Okay, but I want to get public comment before we take action. So, but there's, there's been a motion in a second. Yeah, doc, Dr. Levine? Um, just one suggestion. I mean, I, I assume that it is always the option for the um, supervising physician to request a cures report for the PA. Huh? I mean, that, that is the only thing I could think of that would be, in addition to 20%, would be on an annual basis or some periodicity to, to, for the supervising physician to request a cures report. I think that's something that they, are, they can already do, right? No, they can't? Okay. They can't run it on the licensee. They could run it on the patients of oh. that individual. that you can't run a report that shows for this PA what all did they right. um, do. What you can do is you can run it on those patients of that PA. One by one. One by one. So the new cure system is not going to allow that? You cannot do that, yeah. <laughs> I withdraw my comment. The, the, regula the, the regulatory agency can run them that way, but not the providers. So the system is capable of doing it, but the provider can't. If, if it pleases the board, I'm going to have testimony from Teresa Anderson. If that's okay, public comment, and then we'll. 
resume. I just, I just, I just want to be clear. To... I'm withdrawing my suggestion. Okay. Thank, thank you, Dr. Levine. Dr. Ganada. I just Ganada. wanted to make a comment, sure. and then, and then Teresa. I, I think it's fine. Uh, I think the issue is classifying hydrocodone as Schedule II drug. That's where this came through. I mean, it concerns me that a physician doesn't review OxyContin, which is looked at the same way as hydrocodone. So uh, I, I think I'll go for 20%, but, but it is a concerning that physicians should remember that all Schedule II drugs are not equal. So you got, you got to, uh, your license is also in, in jeopardy because you are the supervising physician. Thank you. Ms. Anderson? Thank you. Teresa Anderson on behalf of California Academy of PAs. Um, I would really, really like to first say thank you. We appreciate the opportunity to work with staff to address the board concerns. Um, totally agree with Dr. Gonadev. There is uh, no, I mean, that's the bottom line. It's the physician's responsibility. So in sort of looking at that, um, the 20%, we really did come to, you know, <laughs> a lot of background information, as you've all seen. Um, so if you have questions on that, I'm happy to answer them. Otherwise, I'm going to assume that everybody has um, seen that information. Um, and really comes down to uh, quality versus quantity. So when you're really looking at those medical record review meetings um, or the 20% or have re having the opportunity to really dig into those 20%, and, and like Jen said, uh, Ms. Samo said, um, that, that comes, um, that 20%, the, the physician gets to choose that, and it could be, that's the floor. So it could be 20, 50, you know, 100 if you like, existing law. Um, so with that, I would just like to answer any questions if there's questions, and once again, say thank you. Uh, we'll stick with public comment. Oh, okay. are you Do you have a little bit more time, or you, you can be done? Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate it. Uh, is there any additional public comment from the audience? Any co public comment from the phone? Any comments from the phone, please press star one. <clears throat> and no comments from the telephone. Thank you. There's been a motion and a second to support SB 337. Ms. Toof, please call the roll. Dr. Bolat? Aye. Dr. Bishop? Aye. Dr. Ganadev? Aye. Dr. Hawkins? Aye. Dr. Krauss? Yes. Dr. Levine? Aye. Dr. Lewis? Aye. Ms. Pines? Aye. Ms. Shipsky? Ms. Wright? Aye. Ms. Yaroslavsky? Aye. Dr. Yip? Mr. Serrano Sewell? Aye. Motion carries. Next item. Okay, the next item is a bill we haven't taken a position on yet, SB 464 Hernandez. This bill would allow a physician and surgeon, registered nurse, a certified, certified nurse midwife, a nurse practitioner, a physician assistant, and a pharmacist acting within the scope of each respective license type to use a self-screening tool that will identify patient risk factors for the use of self-administered hormonal contraceptives by a patient. This bill would require an appropriate prior examination, and after that examination, the practitioner can prescribe, furnish, or dispense as applicable self-administers hormonal contraceptives to the patient. This bill would allow blood pressure, weight, height, and patient health history to be self-reported using the self-screening tool that identifies patient risk factors. An existing law f requires an appropriate prior exam. A physician could already use a self-screening tool for the purpose purposes provided in this bill as long as that appropriate prior exam is performed, which the bill also requires. Um, if Board staff would have concerns if an appropriate prior exam wasn't required, but since it is, board staff is recommending the board take a neutral position on this bill. We need a motion. You need an action, okay. Are there any questions from the members? Ms. Yaroslavsky has made a motion for a neutral position. Is there a second? Second. second. Any public comment from the audience? Any public comment from the phone? No comment from the telephone. Thank you. Ms. Toof, please call the roll. Dr. Bolat? Aye. Dr. Bishop? Aye. Dr. Gonadev? Aye. Dr. Hawkins? Aye. Dr. Krauss? Abstain. Dr. Levine? Aye. Dr. Lewis? Aye. Ms. Pines? Aye. Ms. Shipsky? Ms. Wright? Aye. Ms. Yaroslavsky? Aye. Dr. Yip? Mr. Serrano Sewell? Aye. Motion carries. Next item. SB 467 Hill. Um, you should have gotten a handout with Ledge Council language on this one. Um, this bill is a sunset bill for several boards and includes pro rata requirements for DCA and reporting requirements for the AG's office. But the part that really impacts the board is that this bill would require the director of DCA 
through its Division of Investigation to implement c complaint prior prioritization guidelines for boards to utilize in prior prioritizing the respective complaint and investigation workloads. The guidelines shall be used to determine the referral of complaints to DFI and those that are retained by the healthcare boards for investigation. Since the medical board already has priorities set in law, these prior prioritization requirements should not apply to the medical board. Um, board staff has been in contact with Senate BMP, who is working, basically staffing this bill, and they have agreed that the medical board should be exempted. They've made a commitment that they're going to exempt the board, and this commitment is backed up by the ledge council language, which basically is a first step to the bill being amended. They just couldn't get it in before the break. The legislature's on break right now, so when they get back in August, we have a commitment that will be removed. So at this time, staff is suggesting that we just watch this bill and make sure the amendment gets made, but I have every assurance that it will. Thank you. Okay, so moving on. Um, SB 538 block, this is the one um, scope bill that's still moving. This is the naturopathic bill. This bill has been amended and significantly narrowed. Um, and this basically allows an ND now to prescribe specified drugs without sp physician supervision. Um, and so it basically allows um, an ND to prescribe, administer, order schedule five, and unclassified drugs um, or legend drugs. And so it's been significantly narrowed. A lot of organizations have removed their opposition, but staff was suggesting that um, the same reasons that we opposed the bill before still apply and that the board should continue to oppose. I mean, unless board members are okay with NDs prescribing um, schedule five and um, legend drugs, but staff is um, suggesting that we remain opposed, but it's up to the board. Okay. Yeah. Verification, because I'm not sure what, um, if they are allowed within their scope of practice to prescribe nat nat natural and synthetic stuff, uh, vitamins and things like that. It's not prescribing. It's they're recommending. What, what, what do they do? They recommend, right? So they recommend that they're, you know, you should take some vitamins or what. I'm not sure why we would come up with an oppose to an already an institution that has a, uh, a, a purview within the system. Because Schedule 5 are a little different. So Schedule 5, are they could include, um, like, cough syrup, coding kind of stuff. It's not, like, coding natural cough drugs. Coding number it's, 5? Yep. Can't yeah. Really? Yeah. Yes, yeah. some of it. And then also mm -hmm. antibiotics. It would allow them to I, do I just things like know, antibiotics. I just thought, you know, they couldn't. I, I didn't know it was a Schedule 5 drug. I thought it would be, coding would be a real drug. This allows them to move into the prescribing of a scheduled drug. Oh, that's a problem. Okay. Any additional comments from the members? No, is there a motion? So moved. Do you need one? It's been moved and seconded to oppose staff's recommendation. Are there any comments from the audience? Any public comment from the phone? And no comment from the phone. All right, Ms. Tuv, please call the roll. Dr. Bolat? Aye. Dr. Bishop? Aye. Dr. Gonadev? Aye. Dr. Hawkins? Aye. Dr. Krauss? Yes. Dr. Levine? Aye. Dr. Lewis? Aye. Ms. Pines? Aye. Ms. Wright? Aye. Ms. Yaroslavsky? Aye. Dr. Yip? Aye. Mr. Serrano Sewell? Aye. Uh, motion carries. Okay, that, continue, that concludes my legislative presentation. I have a couple more items after that, but. Proceed. Okay. Agenda item 6B, the status of regulatory actions. The matrix is in your board packet, tab 6, um, page 6B-1. Um, the only thing that I'd really like to point out is the regulations related to CME requirements is still being reviewed as the board has received additional information from ABMS regarding the necessity of these regulations. These regulations will be brought back to the board at the October board meeting. And um, I'm done unless any members have questions. Members, any questions? No questions? Okay. Um, do we have to take public comment? No. It's an update. Do we need to take public comment? I recommend that you do. Is there any public comment on the matrix? Any comment from the phone? No comment from the phone. All right, thank you. Okay, and the agenda item 6C is federal legislation, the Telemedicine for Medicare Act of 2015. You should have been passed out a couple um, congressional bills, S-1778 um, and H.R. 3081. They're essentially the same. Um, in both bills, Medicare participating physicians or practitioners who are licensed or otherwise legally authorized to provide a health care service in a state may provide such a service as a telemedicine service to a Medicare be beneficiary who is in another state. 
Oh, you don't. Oh, oh that's my fault. Oh. All right. Sorry. Lisa's getting. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> So basically, this is the same as the congressional bills before that says, basically, if you're a, a Medicare provider, that you can provide telemedicine services to a patient, a Medicare patient in another state. And so both bills are the same. They're very short. They basically say what I just read. And um, in the past, as you may remember, we, um, we drafted letters and sent letters out to Congress and the authors of these bills saying that we oppose this concept of not requiring state licensure. Um, now we have a bill in each side, so the Senate and the House, um, and we would really like to get a letter out saying that the board opposes this for consumer protection reasons. And so that's what we're, that what we're requesting. We can wait for Lisa to pass them out, but um, it's... Do so you want a motion? We'll make a motion. Sir, is there a motion? I'll make a motion. Ms. Yaroslavsky? I'll second the motion. Crazy. Thank you. It's just my comment is that just because you're on Medicare doesn't mean that you have no protection. It doesn't make sense. If you got it or not. Right. There's been a motion and a second to oppose. Are there any public comment? To inst just to instruct staff to send the letter. Any comment from the phone? No comments from the phone. Thank you. Ms. Toof, I'll call the roll on the motion to oppose and send a letter to that effect. Dr. Yip? Yes, I beg your pardon? Yes or no. Oh, we're voting on it now, Dr. I'm Oh, yes. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Kraus? Aye. Ms. Yaroslavsky? Aye. Dr. Levine? <laughs> Dr. Bishop? Aye. Dr. Lewis? Aye. Dr. Gennadyev? Aye. Dr. Bishop? Aye. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, Dr. Balot. <laughs> Forgive me. Aye. Thank you. Ms. Pines? Aye. Ms. Wright? Aye. Dr. Hawkins? I vote aye as well. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Bishop was paying attention. <laughs> he did. Uh, We'll now move to item seven, the president's report. I'll be very brief in my report. I do want to give an update on a meeting that I had with uh, Director Adwet Kadani, Director of the Department of Consumer Affairs. Our discussion with him and his senior staff included the transition of the investigators and the importance of the board's investigation and disciplinary process as it relates to consumer protection. We also discussed the DCA's presentations of the vertical enforcement process. We had a wonderful exchange of ideas, um, protocol, and how we can work uh, closely and more aligned. It was a wonderfully productive 40-minute discussion. And um, he and his staff complimented the board, this board, in, in, doing, in fulfilling its duty and working closely with DCA. So that was a productive uh, meeting. And, in very, and very briefly, I just want to hit a couple of highlights of the past year. One, we had a great legislative day in October. I think that resulted in Senator Hill being with us today, that new relationship. Kimberly's done an outstanding job in hiring a new deputy director and chief, and chief of enforcement and successfully transferring the investigators to, the, uh, to DCA. We've approved and released an updated guidelines for prescribing controlled substances for pain. I want to thank staff and council for helping with that process. And we've successfully sponsored legislation to ensure documents on serious discipline remains posted on the board's website in an effort to increase transparency. Um, finally, we've had many interested parties meetings in the past year where we've heard ideas um, on what we should be doing. And it's been, I thought, a productive year. Kimberly, you want to add anything? No, I just, I, I think the other big thing that the board did is pass the regulations on SB 1441. And I, you know, just congratulate the board on a lot of work that they've done in the last year. Colleagues, any comments on that report? No? Any public comment? Any, oh, yes, Dr. Hawkins. Uh, these are challenging budgetary times, and the director is aware of our concern. And we'll be, it'll be part of a presentation tomorrow. Kimberly's reminded me. 
Thank you. Any public comment from the audience? Any comment from the phone? No comment from the phone. Thank you. We'll now move to agenda item eight, update from the executive committee. This afternoon, the executive committee met. We had a, a host of issues. We touched on the, we had presentations from Ms. Kirkmeyer and her staff on the department's budget, the bureau's budget, our customer satisfaction survey, and our status report on the strategic plan. We also heard suggestions from the executive committee members on agenda items for our next committee meeting in October. The focus of that meeting will be our public outreach efforts, public education efforts, and how we can best utilize staff, and more importantly, us, the members, as ambassadors for the medical board in promoting consumer protection in our mission. Are there any questions? None? Thank you, uh, colleagues that were at the meeting. Any comments from the public? Seeing none from the audience, any comments from the phone? And no comments from the phone. All right, thank you. We'll now have an update on the licensing committee. Dr. Bishop. Thank you. Um, the licensing committee immediate met today and approved the minutes from the July 24, 2014 meeting. Mr. Warden provided an update regarding the licensing program for the fat past fiscal year. Mr. Warden thanked the licensing managers and staff for their hard work. Mr. Warden advised the committee the board licensed 5,873 physicians in fiscal year 14-15, an increase of 351 licenses from fiscal year 13-14. Licensing staff were required to work overtime to process all of the applications for the residents and fellows who needed licensure by July 1, 2015, and kudos to them from my standpoint. The call center received 1,500, I'm sorry, 155,092 calls, uh, which is an increase of 6,624 more calls than in fiscal year 1314. Uh, Mr. Warden felt that this was largely due to questions about the, the uh, new uh, licensing system with Breeze. Uh, there are 107 medical schools pending review for recognition by the board. Seven schools have pending self-assessment reports. Mr. Warden provided an update on the June 30, 2015 interested parties meeting in Sacramento regarding minimum requirements for accredited postgraduate training for licensure and physician reentry. Staff plans to hold another interested parties meeting in Southern California within the next few months. And I'd like to encourage all interested parties to attend this meeting. I think it's critical to have the input from the public. Thank you. Any questions for Dr. Bishop? Comments? Any public comments from the audience on Dr. Bishop's licensing report? Any comments from the phone? No comments from the phone. Thank you, Dr. Bishop, for your leadership. We'll now move to the Education and Wellness Committee. Ms. Yaroslawski. Thank you, Mr. Uh, President. The Education and Wellness Committee met earlier this afternoon, and minutes were presented and approved from the committee's January 29, 2015 meeting. The committee was treated to a presentation from Dr. Ashby Wolf who is the Chief Medical Officer for Region 9 for the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Dr. Wolf addressed updates regarding the Affordable Care Act and provided information on the ACA's compliance mandate for physicians, the intent of which is to induce healthcare professionals to develop a compliance plan that will better pr help protect them from the risk of improper conduct. Dr. Wolf addressed the seven core com uh, excuse me, elements of an effective compliance program written policies and procedures and standard of conduct, compliance program oversight, training and education, opening the lines of communication, auditing and monitoring, consistent discipline and corrective answer, uh, actions. The committee was also, um, had also a presentation by Dr. Andrus Shola uh, from here, in, at, in, not here, but sorry, from UC uh, Davis. He's a professor of clinical psychiatry and a medical director of the Northgate Point Regional Support Team on trauma-informed care and its impact on lifelong health. He pointed out how childhood trauma and adverse childhood experiences can affect one's health, including increased morbidity and premature mortality. Uh, future agenda items for the next meeting are on hold right now, and we will take them under consideration. And if anyone 
any of the uh, members of the board have any suggestions, please let staff know or let me know. We'd appreciate it. That concludes my report. Thank you. Are there any questions or comments from the members? Uh, yes, Ms. Staroslavsky. Um, one of the things that I'm interested in is the, the issue of physician burnout. I'm not sure if that's something you feel would be worth discussing or looking into in your, your uh, um, committee. It apparently is a quite a much larger problem that's, that's been recognized. So I think it would be interesting to have an expert talk on that topic. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any comments from the audience? Seeing none, are there any comments from the telephone? No comments from the phone. All right. Thank you, Ms. Larisowski, for your report and leadership. Uh, the board stands adjourned until tomorrow at 9 a.m. Thank you.